If you haven't been with us before, um, my name is Kristen and I am the Curator of Community and Academic Programs. And it is my pleasure to bring back a guest speaker, Ryan Grover. Hi. <laughs> um, so today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing a little bit of a sort of an interview and in conversation at the beginning of our program and then taking you up close to the artwork, talking about Winslow Homer, the artwork and some of the scenes that we'll be looking at in more detail. Excellent. Hi, Ryan. Hi. <laughs> so for those who didn't join us the first time, um, can you tell us a little bit about who is Winslow Homer? Um, well, Winslow Homer, first thing that you should know is that Winslow Homer is largely sort of self-trained. He was, um, came up as an illustrator. He wanted to be able to create images uh, that would be published in magazines and newspapers. And then before too long, um, well, he had an enormous amount of success doing that. And uh, before too long, he started to branch over into painting. And then he's really much better known today as a painter of um, American life, sort of the slightly idealized version of American life in the second half of the 19th century. Great. Now, um, as our viewers can probably tell, uh, what we're looking at here isn't a painting. Nope. What are we looking at tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so these are actually about 200, just slightly over 200 of the 250 illustrations, the prints that he created during his career. So um, uh, before, uh, uh, as he was transitioning to become that painter. So. Um, his career in printmaking probably spanned over about a 20, 25 year period of time. And what you're seeing here are the images, the shows that, the, what the show is composed of are images that he created for, play, uh, for publications like Scribner's and other sort of uh, prominent periodicals, most of them being printed in like Philadelphia and New York in the years leading up to the American Civil War and then in the years just after the American Civil War. Wonderful. Now, some of the questions we've been having about this collection on display um, is kind of a two part question. Mm -hmm. um, one, are these original prints that would have been in the newspaper or are they reproductions? Um, so these are original. Um, so they are all prints are reproductions. These are created from the plates that were created from Winslow Homer's print. Uh, uh, Winslow Homer's drawings. So he would give these plates, or he would give these drawings to the printer, they would create the plate, and then the plate would be what was printed into newspapers, magazines, book publications, um, pretty much any way that it could be printed in those uh, in, in the second half of the 1800s. And so what you're seeing here represents those kinds of, or those images that were being reproduced. And they were, in all cases, printed in the 1800s. These are especially fine examples of that work. Um, oftentimes they were printed on not great paper or they were um, considered somewhat disposable materials. So the fact that so many exist and so many have been remembered and so many have been collected into this one collection really do, um, it's, it's, it's pretty astounding. And for any of our viewers, if you do come see this exhibition in person, uh, one major change is that it's usually a lot darker in here. Um, if you joined us a little bit earlier, you saw us actually change the lighting. Um, and the reason we did that and the reason if you come see it will be darker is because these prints are on that delicate paper material. Uh, yeah. They are light sensitive for sure. But yeah, the prints that you're looking at, the actual images that you're looking at here were produced under the Yes, so all of the stuff in this exhibition was created in some way, it to us is historical content. Um, it is not someone nowadays kind of making these images, but they were in fact made during the late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, almost everything here is the 
1700s by the time that um, he lived till 1910 and he was very much steep, uh, very much steeped into sort of his painting practice at that point once he um, once Winslow Homer was able to make a living off of paintings he really wasn't very careful at all oh the poor printing <laughs> Um, I should point out, though, one of the things that's really interesting about this uh, is that this show does not differentiate against those things, those objects that were created as like book illustrations or illustrations um, to illuminate stories that were being published within um, certain periodicals um, from those prints, maybe sometimes larger scale prints that were very collectible and even frameable during his lifetime. So there's a lot here that was meant for um, fast reproduction so that you could see, you know, just beautiful images that um, in this uh, emerging printing and publication industry um, of the Industrial Revolution here in America. Um, and then there were other things that were absolutely meant to be shared on a wall and shared and collected as print collectors in America were starting to emerge in the 1800s. So there was a lot here that was very highly prized even during his lifetime. And I mean, one of the things that I think we can really talk about is that Winslow Homer was one of the first artists in America to become really, really famous for fine art prints. Hmm. I did not know that one. Yeah. Now, is there a way when the average person goes to like an antique shop or something mm -hmm. to tell apart the mass consumption printing from the fine art collectible print? Part of that just has to do with the way that um, uh, individual images are printed. So um, a lot of these were printed on uh, wood block printing. So it's a, um, a, a kind of a wood cut printing, really, um, because of the way that it's sort of engraved into or intaglio is cut from the end pieces of the wood. So it's especially hard and it's uh, able to print in really fine details and lots and lots and lots of them. When these images are now reproduced today, you're, what you're seeing is a photographic process where a photo of the print from the 1800s has been then reproduced, laser printer, um, uh, what do they call it, half tone, um, with you know, the four point or the, the, the four type printing processes that made up of tiny little dots of ink. Um, uh, this, um, or excuse me, I guess it's sort of offset lithography, but um, these uh, much more industrialized printing processes are what's at play. The surface of those uh, prints are quite a bit different, but you have to get really close up and you have to you have to get all nerd like that. So um, uh, yeah, if you have a question, just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, so let's go ahead and start jumping I wanted in. to ask you a question. So um, uh, for those of you that didn't know it, I used to work here at the Biggs and I was the person who was in charge of putting this great show on. And then I left. <laughs> about three minutes later and so how has the show been going how is it being received by the public yeah no it's been going really great we've actually had uh just this past weekend we had someone come in and they maybe this isn't the greatest advertising part but they came in not knowing that we had Winslow Homer uh and they came in and there's a light box that you can see if you come visit us from right behind the desk of one of his artworks that we have the print version of and some photographs that inspired it. Uh, and they saw the, the light box and immediately were like, you have Winslow Homer? Oh my God, I am a collector of prints. This is a print show. And they got so excited and they spent like four hours in just this exhibition, um, which while it's over 200 works that it's a lot of time in a single exhibition. It's true, it's true. Um, <laughs> So it's been going really great. We've been having a lot of enthusiastic people coming through the museum to see this. Awesome. And is there any particular subject that people are especially drawn to or that they comment the most about? They comment. Let me jump in here for yes. a quick second. Um, just so that you all know, if you haven't been able to, to come to the show yet, and why would you have waited, honestly? Of course, you come to the show. But the show is um, split up into all sorts of different themes. So it's not necessarily correct. Chronolo uh, chronological um, to his career per se, although some of his early portraits have been separated, some of his book illustrations have been separated. Those are sort of distinctive periods in his career. But this um, this world of genre imagery, imagery these uh, very common sort of day in the life moments that he captures um, in this print media are separated into groups like uh, professions, um, leisure pursuits, 
um, the rise of um, the American adoration of the American beaches on the East Coast. Um, the, the Civil War is a huge sec section. Um, uh, the the uh, expansion of women's place within society. I mean, there's all these really, really interesting, really rich kinds of topics going on. So was there one that people are um, talking about more than others? Um, there's two, actually. Uh, one of the ones has been the beaches. Yeah. Uh, the beach scenes we went into in detail last time. Um, they're just marvelous. And it's so many people grouped together and in such fine detail. And of course, trying to do printmaking of the water mm -hmm. is always very interesting to see. Um, and so people have been responding to actually what we talked about last time, which was like the social, the, the like breaking down of social barriers that would happen at the beach and just how unique that was. Um, and then interestingly, the other part that people have been really interested in and really commenting about has been our silhouette section. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, which the reason I say that's interesting is because as you'll see as we go through here, these prints are extremely detailed. The line work is very fine um, and the rendering is very realistic. And so for the people, for people to be commenting a lot on just silhouette pieces, uh, I think is unique. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no. So Ryan, before yeah. we jump in and start letting all of our viewers get close to the different artworks, sure. um, can you give us a, a heads up of what scenes we'll be looking at today? So the last time we really looked at um, women's roles and the sort of expansion of women's roles in society, we looked at the democratization of the beach space, spaces um, and sort of the rise of the leisure class activity in America. That seemed to be sort of like where we were going with a lot of it last time. This time I thought because, you know, we just went through Labor Day. And so um, I thought we'd get a little bit more of a realist edge as opposed to sort of a leisure edge. And, um, and I thought that we would talk about sort of um, American professions, people at work, people in labor, uh, people not so much um, enjoying their day as opposed, but more really sort of like working through their day. And, um, and then I thought that we would tackle some of this imagery from the Civil War because it's such a huge section here. And it's just really, really rich with imagery. It's, um, yeah, he seems to have, he, he covered, Winslow Homer covered the, 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 he created imagery about the Civil War throughout the entire period. And it seems like he became a better printmaker because of it. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty astounding stuff. Yeah, so um, as we get into that, just so everyone knows, uh, Winslow Homer was one of the artists commissioned to kind of like move with the army and send back these images uh, to be printed in newspapers. Yeah. Um, so he's really kind of one of the first wave of artist soldiers in the US at least. In a way, in a yeah. way. I mean, there, there definitely had been, um, there had definitely been examples of it before then, but not necessarily images that were as widely uh, distributed as those were. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, all right. So I thought we were just going to sort of like um, float into some of these smaller images and then we'll maybe rotate out on either side. And I'm just going to kick this chair out of the way so that nobody um, trips on it. <laughs> but um, so one of the things that's really interesting about a lot of uh, Winslow Homer's um, imagery around labor has to do with his attention to anatomy. So he seems to have been very, um, how do I want to put it, very respectful of the human body in motion, very respectful of um, the, uh, the presence that these individuals, uh, these, these, these working individuals had on the paper. And um, what's sort of interesting from my perspective is that when we were looking at some of the images that we saw of the beach and of the leisure classes, sometimes the images, sometimes the subjects got a little stiff. They, um, they had this sort of weird buoyancy in the water and they had this kind of almost, there were moments where it had this very sort of comic kind of character to them. Um, and, and perhaps what we're looking at is that, um, <laughs> Bear with me, my camera broke. Thanks everyone. You're on, okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, 
but that stiffness seems to dissipate when he is talking about this kind of quiet work that's um, and representing the work ethic. Something else, some sort of spirit comes out in him that's um, particularly poignant. And um, uh, and I don't know, in a way, this sort of um, seems to define America at this time in the, in the biggest way. Um, you know, we love this idea of sort of playing on the beach and kind of um, uh, thinking about the sort of expanding roles of people, but the images that he sort of captured at this moment really sort of elevate the worker, the, the common man, in really, um, I think, really, uh, in really strong and sort of interesting ways. And again, just sort of like um, like the image that you're looking at here, like there's just a distinct, um, uh, the body has a pr distinct presence. It's uh, this, uh, something that's very strong, something that's very sort of uh, quiet about this. And the work is uh, just really, really fine. Um, perhaps even sort of evocative of the paintings that he will come to um, be known for in, in, the, in, in the not too distant future. Um, Kristen, if you wanna head down to the bottom here, this is actually one of my favorite prints in the entire show. And it's called Spring Farm Work, Grafting, where the individual here is grafting um, one particular kind of tree species onto the, uh, the, the, the base of another tree um, in order to um, allow it to grow. And, um, and this is sometimes done with like fruit trees and things of that nature. And just so the, the, the attention that's being placed upon, again, that sort of anatomical features, the position of the body, um, there's a kind of lightness to this that is really, really interesting to me. And, um, and there's just a kind, of, um, a kind of realism or an attempt to sort of capture a kind of realism that was kind of missing, I think, from a lot of his work earlier. This one, uh, this work is from about 1870. Now in this upper right hand corner, we have <laughs> a depiction of, I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, so this scene is actually very, very familiar to me. This is called the winter morning shoveling out. And um, I just can't even imagine what that kind of snow covered would, would be like today. But um, but it's a scene that I think would have uh, di directly appealed to a great number of individuals um, that would have been viewing this. This would uh, have been the type of image that would have driven sales within a work because people would have been able to see themselves in this experience. Uh, the detail I think is pretty interesting. So these beautiful houses in the, or I, I mean, the sort of evocation of houses, you can barely see them, but um, this kind of, wooden structures with the sort of pedimented roof um, space here. This is uh, another, this is a New England scene. Winslow Homer worked pretty much exclusively in New England. Um, the sort of square structure in the corner here with these four, um, I guess they're sort of chimneys heading up. I don't really, I mean, I can't imagine anything else that would sort of head up, that would shoot upwards. But this level of detail, I think, is pretty interesting and just sort of um, causes an individual to really start thinking about what it is specifically that they're seeing. As we head down, that level of detail is really um, uh, put in play here to not only talk about sort of like the way that the lumberjack is sort of how this lumberjack is bringing a tree down. Although I would imagine that this is meant, is it meant to fall forward or backwards because it's about to take his friend out here. Um, but I love him like depicted in the snowshoes. Like he hasn't even gotten himself out of the snowshoes and he's going after this, um, going after this tree. Right down to sort of like the costume he's wearing, the kind of hat he's wearing, the way that he holds his axe. I mean, all of these little details seem not to be lost on this on this artist. And then heading a little bit further down, we see another sort of um, characteristic that we find in a lot of Winslow Homer's images, and that sort of depiction of children. Um, children in labor, ch children in leisure, children in their educational environments. Um, and it's something that's, again, sort of he comes back to. Um, I think that 
his inherently sort of idealistic point of view is uh, sort of crystallized with the depiction of kids. And um, there's just a lot of sort of uh, interesting subjects that rotate in and out or that in which kids rotate in and out of. Um, and as we were saying earlier, as I was saying earlier, this is really, I mean, this is meant to, help, to pull at your heartstrings. This is meant to be emotional, like emotionally, con um, emotionally charged content. This is, uh, uh, this is meant to turn pages. Similar kind of su um, subject matter here called making hay. And sometimes we sort of see these, um, these uh, interesting and kind of almost sweet sort of illusions that um, Winslow Homer makes. So you have this expression making hay. I'm using you to block the glare. Oh, which glare here? The, there you go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, making hay. So obviously you have this sort of figure in the left-hand side of the page, as well as an individual in the background who is, um, you know, cutting grass and like he's making hay. But then you have this sort of allusion, this sort of sweet allusion to um, kissing. Isn't that what the making hay is meant to be <laughs> um, of this um, boy and girl in the um, lower right-hand corner? So there's this kind of allusion to sort of courtship as well. So as, um, as we head through the subject matter, it makes me wonder like Winslow Homer must not have gone home very often. He must not have spent a lot of time um, just in isolation. He seems to have been a consummate observer. I mean, um, don't get me wrong, the subject matter is, you know, it's not as if you know, everything that he's depicting is, uh, is, is a ball with um, a Parisian countess or you know, these sort of extreme sort of like you know, musical festivals or anything like that, like he's not, it's not like he's. Um, it's not like he's in the most. He, it's not like he's always in the most sort of like historically significant moments in our histories. Um, but he seems to have observed so many of these delicate, sort of sweet moments. Um, all of these little and, and and in such excruciating detail that it's just really, really remarkable. He must have had a pad and paper in front of him all the time. He must have been constantly recording his observations. He must have. Um, just imagine the amount of work that a person has to do in order to be able to record the details here. Um, you know, the sort of distance between the figure that's blowing the sort of uh, this, uh, it's called the dinner horn, the title of the piece, but then all of the figures in the background here that are being called into dinner. Um, uh, even the patterning of the dress, the position of the cats, um, uh, these sort of flat, bowl-like shapes that must have They're something wash to do. Oh, are they? Yeah. One of them was. You see one here um, with WH, he has sort of injected his own little signature into the side of it. And if you joined us last time, we saw that that WH is also worked into many of the beach scenes as like writing in the sand. Um, so right. he did get creative in how he signed his pieces. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, his kind of bread and butter um, has to do with this kind of um, emergence of the uh, middle classes, the American middle class, the industrial um, ones that were um, uh, they, they were they were uh, how do I say this? A middle class that is growing out of the um, industrial revolution. So you find individuals that are you know these are fashionable individuals. You can sort of see with this lovely sort of the costume, the dress that she's wearing, the hat that she's wearing, the hat that he is wearing, the sort of um, the uh, fashionable mustache and the, the, um, the tie. Um, this is ultimately the class of individuals that were buying the majority of his prints, the ones that were 
uh, fueling the print industry in which he was um, employed. Uh, and so he was definitely trying to appeal to this middle class. Um, one of the things that I love about this particular print though, and I don't know if you can see how well you can see this in the detail, but I want you to just sort of take notice. This is how, so how does one capture a moving wheel with a print? And so this was um, Winslow Homer, he kind of created these kind of spoke shapes he didn't sort of create a blurring sensation of the individual um, uh, supports for the wooden wheel of this carriage, um, of this cart, but he did create these kind of like shadows of those um, in order to, to imply motion. And then that implication is um, compounded by the smoke, or not smoke, excuse me, like the dust from the road that's um, being, that's, that the wheels are billowing upwards and the grass that's falling out of the back of this hay wagon. Um, these are supposed to be figures that are sort of tranching along. They're sort of um, moving pretty quickly. It's interesting that they decided to keep the gate open in the back because half of them could have fallen out. But um, I love these sort of, um, you know, this is sort of a pictorial problem that people have when they're trying to depict, um, when they're trying to think of ways to be able to depict um, subjects in motion using such stiff media as, um, as this kind of engraving. So it's, uh, I, I just love the, the solutions that the artists come up with. And they're always so distinctive. So we're still working through this uh, through this camera. The, the camera is moving very slowly with us today, but um, we will we will persevere. I promise. <laughs> and so um, I am going to start us into the um, into the Civil War period, and um, the first images are images that are sort of leading us into the Civil War. Um, but and and talking about the recruitment of troops, um, but then things become much more, um, in, much bolder, much more embattled, much um, much heavier as we go a little bit through. I'm just moving this a little bit. So, for instance, um, here is crew of the United States steamship uh, steamship sloop Colorado um, shipped at Boston, June of 1861. And you can see, to see this group of sailors. And this is sort of a record of a moment um, in 1861. Um, this was published in Harper's Weekly, and this was meant to be more of sort of a news source. Um, photography had exists at this point. There are photographers since the 1840s, um, and in America picking up speed after about 1850. But we're really not yet publishing reproductions of photographs within uh, publications like Harper's Weekly. Um, it's still kind of it's being used for portraiture. It's being used um, as kind of uh, small collectibles, but it's not yet meant to sort of capture these moments in history of these sort of uh, unique and interesting um, experiences that are happening within um, the sort of American scene. But here. Winslow Homer is uh, talking about um, this manning of the, the steam sloop Colorado, called Colorado, um, in Boston in 1861, as things are, um, as um, tensions are growing, I guess you could say. So up above it, um, this is um, kind of an unusual image for Winslow Homer. Winslow Homer does not do an enormous number of depictions of um, scenes with African Americans during this time frame, and he is not. I have to say, he's not an overtly sort of political character, but he does try to capture sort of um, important moments. This is um, the title that. Um, this piece was given 
when it was produced in 1860 is called Expulsion of Negroes and Abolitionists from uh, Tremont T Temple, Boston, Massachusetts on December 3rd, 1860. And I wanna point out, so this event happened on December 3rd, he captures the details of it and it is already in publication. So it's already in print by December 15th, 1860. So just about, just less than two weeks later, after the event happens. And so this is the expulsion of African-Americans and abolitionists from the Tremont Temple just weeks before the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it was, um, it was, uh, it was a, a chance to sort of capture in a lot of ways the racial mood of America, even in Boston, where individual abolitionists and the individuals who they are supporting are being um, acted upon by, entire, by large crowds in this New England city. Um, this is, uh, and these are individuals that will ultimately fight on the Confederacy, and yet at the same time, he's capturing this really, really tense racial moment in, um, in Boston and Massachusetts history. And um, there were other, subjects like this happening, um, other depictions of um, violence against abolitionists, violence against African-Americans during this time frame, but they were rather rare, um, especially in terms of the depiction. They were so controversial and they, people were being so, um, people were so upset about them that they had a difficult time really viewing them. So there was a, um, there was, you know, that sort of double-edged sword, like you, uh, you want to know what's happening in the news. This was newsworthy. This was news depiction. This is sort of almost a kind of photojournalism in a way, although obviously he's taking a lot of liberties because, I, you know, there's not, nothing to say he was even there. But he was trying to pictorialize this historic moment for, for Harper's and to put it out in record time. As we move a little bit further down, we see um, his uh, another sort of historic, uh, historically significant moment where um, Abraham Lincoln is passing at Washington, um, procession at Washington, passing the gate of the Capitol grounds. So this is part, this is his inauguration procession um, happening in March of 1861. Um, in the past, I heard this not too long ago, um, and I think it was with the last election and had not really known it before. Um, the, uh, let me see if I can sort of lock a little bit of this imagery. Um, the election still happened in November. The actual inauguration would happen later because it took longer for the incoming president to get to DC to actually move there. Um, so we don't see January inaugurations. We see uh, sort of early spring inaugurations. Even um, the image that's below it is not necessarily of the same sort of um, uh, same sort of like importance historically. It's not that sort of like historically, um, you know, it's not a presidential procession. It's not an inauguration moment. Um, but even when, uh, even so, during this period, uh, Winslow Homer, even when he is uh, depicting this what the seemingly sort of sweet imagery of these women in these very fashionable outfits and this fashionable interior, this sort of uh, kind of growing Victorian kind of interior. And um, this is now just a couple of months after that inauguration, it's being depicted in June 29th of 1861. This is called The War, Making Havelocks for the Volunteers. So this is a group of women that are creating through handcrafts Different, I don't know even sure what a Havelock is, but cloth cover for a service cap. Oh, interesting. So it's, it's, um, when we're looking at these, it's kind of like that little piece. Mm -hmm. 
cloth cover for a service cap. So that, is it like a weatherizing? It looks like that, kind of like it, I'm not 100% positive, but I believe it's like sort of this little wrap piece Interesting. that can cover different parts of it. Huh. Yeah. If anybody from home um, knows uh, what that is or has a chat second to look it up on Google, please let us know because we are stumped ourselves, but women are able to make them and they're make, making them in large enough numbers to be able to supply um, soldiers that are volunteering for the war effort. Yep, so the flap of the Havelock, so, so if we do get closer to her, we have this little piece that ties onto the service cap. And then there's this cloth that goes behind it that will cover your neck. Oh, interesting. Um, to protect it from sun and I guess snow. I mean, I, it's not water. Oh, uh, so it's against the back. Like yeah. It sort of drapes over the back. Yeah, so it almost looks like a veil. So you can see on her, we have the little wrap on. And then we have this coming down. Yeah, so she's kind of modeling the half lock. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and so getting back to that sort of inauguration view, we saw um, uh, that inaugural procession that was uh, published on March 16, 1861. And on the same date, just to um, our left here, is an actual um, depiction of the inauguration on the same day. So again, I just want you to sort of um, considering the considering the um, considering the scale and detail of these pieces. I just want you to take a second to sort of think about the amount of detail, amount of work that's going into this work, how quickly this is being done. Think about the skill that an individual has developed in order to be able to create images this quickly, and then that still has to be given to the wood, um, the wood engraver in order to be able to create the wood matrix and then go through the printing process. So he's not even giving, being given all that amount of time like this. Again, this is only like 10 days after the, after the fact to have it published. I mean, it's pretty incredible. It must have happened. He must have had images within like two days, three days before it had to go through the publishing or through the printing process. One of the things that I really loved about this one, and sorry about my, my horrible shadow here, um, not only is the crowd below, the one that's looking at the inauguration, everybody is so individualized. Sure, there's a lot of people in top hats, but that was, you know, that was the times. But just the mere fact that there's just so many, ind so many individualized um, folks in this crowd, it's again, just sort of speaks to that level of, uh, that level of detail. Then we start getting into some of the action. One of the things that I love about, um, about this time period is that um, people's visual understanding of the Civil War was created through a lot of different artistic endeavors. So there were, at the fine art level, there were painters that were creating genre images with soldiers, the women at home, the families that were left behind, uh, people who uh, won and lost economically because of the war, um, portraits of individuals during that time period. And then there were photographers. So there were actual sort of like um, war correspondents for lack of a better word, individuals that were actually on the battlefields moments after the battles are ended. And they're out there taking photographs of the aftermath. Um, sometimes they capture literally like fallen soldiers before they've been had a chance to even be like retrieved from those battlegrounds. Um, there are uh, just grisly, awful, awful images, but it's always after the war or after the battle because photography wasn't fast enough yet to be able to actually shoot with any sense of clarity figures in motion. And then sort of somewhere in between there is guys like Winslow Homer and probably none quite as successful as Winslow Homer. He really sort of came to, into his own, I think, with the Civil, Wars, uh, the Civil War imagery. Um, 
And he was doing other images at this time. But of course, you can imagine um, because of the scale of the Civil War, because it involves so many people within America, um, because so many lives were lost, um, and it spread across such, huge, such a vast amount of our country, um, that it was the preoccupation of most newspapers at this time, um, and magazines and other sort of uh, print sources. And so, um, so there's just a lot of them. We're not going to go into like total detail here, but um, we'll have you start taking a look at some of this first set of images um, depicting soldiers in the moments before the war. So this is the Army of the Potomac, our outlying picket in the woods from June of 1862. And so you can see individuals kind of uh, sort of in, I guess they're sort of in reconnaissance. They're looking, um, trying to find the individuals that they will be um, uh, battling in the short in, in, the, in the short period. Um, but it's those sort of like that's it's supposed to be this kind of moment of tension, this moment of sort of rising tension. Similarly, the image just below it called a night reconnaissance um, on the uh, on the Potomac, and um, very much related in subject matter. These figures, slightly different type of dress though, different kind of regiment, and you can see in the distance that they are observing at nighttime this encampment of the enemy. There is these sort of wonderfully supportive images of the industry of war. So you see here filling cartridges at the United States Arsenal at Watertown, Massachusetts. So these are individuals that are um, employed basically to help create guns. And we think about World War II as the great um, employer of women. But here we see women building munitions, supply and um, getting uh, ready to, uh, you know, cr creating bullets basically for, uh, for the Confederacy. Oh, we see those tubs again. See those tubs after washing? They're for gunpowder. <laughs> I'm just cheesing. <laughs> there are even um, sort of um, kind of remarkable images of um, sort of moments between tensions, moments of rest within the encampments, um, moments, and, and interestingly, ways to be able to detect, depict the wide variety of individuals that worked within the Confederate Army, um, uh, individuals that had um, come from a lot of different origins, wearing a variety of different costumes, a variety of different um, uh, uniforms, and um, ultimately serving different functions within the, within the um, within the Confederacy. Remind me what this is it's called the a bivouac fire on the Potomac from December of 1861. This was published just a few days before Christmas. And Kristen, you know this image better, way better than I do. What did you learn about this image? So a couple of things I learned about this image. Uh, one of the foremost was actually the uniforms being worn. As Ryan was describing, there's a bunch of different uniforms here. Here we have the dancer in kind of your standard union uniform with just his jacket removed. Uh, but if you look closely in the background, you start seeing these very unique uniforms. We have one here of the man on the left with the distinctive mustache and kind of, yeah, kind of goatee looking uh, facial hair. And you very see him, foreign. you have it mixed in uh, throughout this very like carefully designed and embroidered uniform. Um, now this uniform is still in use in different places. 
This is the Zoav Regiment. This particular one is based in New York. Um, whereas many of the soldier uniforms are designed to kind of blend in, in this case, like grays were typically worn um, in the Union Army. Does that seem right? Gray, blue, a dark color. Um, the Zoav uniforms were actually meant to stand out. They were highly decorative, uh, red and blue. They have sort of a harem styled pants and they are designed to be very vibrant and to catch notice. They come from French African uh, sort of influence as well, which is overall, they tried to blend together this multicultural different design where of course you have some of the Middle Eastern style pants coming in through sort of Moorish influence through Spain and into France. Um, as well as in Africa itself, and then blending with traditional sort of African, you have Berber designs that are coming into this uniform, all to sort of represent just this long lineage of very uh, well-organized fighting groups. Um, so the Zoab originally were a French legion. Um, and then, uh, as I said, of French African soldiers who were notorious soldiers, they were highly skilled, um, kind of feared, which is why they wore these bright, colorful uniforms. And so in the American Civil War, you start having American regiments inspired by uh, these French regiments. And so they took the same uniform. Yeah. Down to, uh, they actually wear like fez hats with the little tassels. Um, this guy has a good one coming off the back as well. So they 100% stood out against the typical uniforms of the time. Here we have another one. Ryan mentioned that this one came out just before Christmas. This is a Christmas scene of soldiers opening their Christmas boxes in the camps. You see them pulling out things like mittens, um, hats, candies, uh, undergarments of various sizes, books, uh, a lot of liquor. Um, just having a good time. Typically at this time period, people would stop fighting uh, during the Christmas holiday. Uh, you can even see in the background that there's like Christmas trees kind of being put up throughout the camp, which is a little silly, but I love it. And in that spirit of fellowship, um, this is uh, in this was published just a couple of days after Christmas in 1861. Again, just cranking out these images. And this is a bazaar that was being held to um, uh, support, like the, the proceeds that were being created through the sale of the items that you see on, on and all the individuals that are sort of circulated around here. This whole sort of scene is meant to be able to raise money for the poor, for um, people that have uh, been left homeless because of the war. Um, and those individuals that you need. So this is happening, um, this particular depiction was happening in New York City, um, again, in December of 1861. But Winslow Homer was also really, really well known for depicting the realities of that war. Here we see the War for the Union, 1862, a bayonet charge, published in July 12th of 1862. And you can see the waves and waves and waves of soldiers that are sort of um, crowding over this landscape in order to be able to charge the opposing forces and um, attempting, and then you can see additional, 
not cavalry, but um, what do they call that? The, the individuals that are on foot. I'm clearly not a military historian. I'm probably even mi mixing up the Union and the Confederacy left and right. I'm horrible at this, but um, but but I am pretty good at talking about the sort of individualization, individualization of the soldiers that you see within this uh, scene all of the almost portrait-like depictions of individual people in this, and that dedication to trying to depict the way that these soldiers would have interacted within these scenes, the drummer that's falling, the way that they're charging, the line of um, sort of the wave of individuals moving forward. And just sort of the terror, I think that one of the things that's really sort of so interesting about this uh, depiction is that you really are sort of like almost on the, the uh, you're sort of positioned as the individuals that are being sort of taken over. You um, see the faces of these, um, of these folks as they come rushing towards you with these bayonets exposed. Um, it's, um, It's just a pretty, um, it's just a sort of horrific scene. And I can imagine it um, really sort of burning people's imaginations at this time. But they were hungry for it. They, um, everybody, everybody knew somebody that was fighting. Everybody knew somebody that was involved with the war effort. Everybody knew. And there were such a range of ages of individuals that were actually participating in the war. Um, uh, the whole, you know, the whole United States as we knew it then was dedicated to her, the support of this war effort. And so on both sides, and so everybody was involved. And so images like this helped to cement the realities of that war in their minds. Like this is what they, it, it helped individual, individuals to sort of understand um, what was happening, what it was that they were really doing there. I think we have time for one more. What should it be? Well, maybe let's take a quick look at this aftermath, sort of the reality of war as well. This is called the surgeon at work at the rear during an engagement, July 12, 1862. You can see the surgeon, I believe, is here, hand coming up against someone's body, performing some kind of activity. There's an individual that's helping to hold him down here. And in the background, you can see um, someone on a stretcher being carried over. You can also see that over here. Medical supplies are arriving in the back form of this backpack. There is another sort of medical procedure taking place. And you can even see a scalpel in his hand with the wound exposed and bleeding, that pleading look into his eyes. Truly frightening. And again, in a world without television, in a world where um, people wouldn't even necessarily have had access to the photography that was the little bit of photography that was being done um, of these scenes. I mean, this was as real as it got in terms of um, people's sort of identification with this period. It's wild. So again, you guys should come. You should come and see this because again, I mean, we showed you maybe what, 20 images? There are 10 times that many images to come and see in this show. There's such a variance and it's just, I mean, you could come several times and still not be able to take it all in. So do we have any questions? Well, I won't belabor anything. <laughs> um, we will sign off in just a second unless there's anything that somebody wants to see. 
Brian, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned that the worker scene uh, was one of your favorites, the tree grafting scene. Yeah. Now, I know Winslow and Homer often use photographs for kind of inspiration or would model them after people. Do we have any of those photographs or preliminary sketches in this exhibition? Less about uh, preliminary sketches, but we do have photographs that were inspiration, a few photographs that were inspiration to Winslow Homer. Um, but also there's a pretty heavy amount of interpretation about what photography meant during this time period, how it was influencing artists like Winslow Homer, how it was informing Winslow Homer specifically. So it's, um, it's not like we just have sort of a stash of his photographs that he was using as reference materials. Um, it was more that he was responding to a world of images that were starting to explode with photography and as well with, print, with the world of print um, that, that he was a contributor to. And so um, it's, uh, it's this sort of nice, uh, this wonderfully sort of nuanced storyline about his relationship to photography. And it's definitely something that's uh, present within the um, exhibition and also within the catalog. All right, thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully see you in future programming.